Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and into ages of ages. Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things. The treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us. Cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hi, Annie. Father Hezekiah, how lovely to see you once again. Nice to be here with everyone joining together for our Sunday Gospel Reflection. Uh, here for the 21st Sunday in Ordinary Time, uh, as we continue our uh, walk through John chapter 6. This week, uh, our Old Testament readings from the book of Joshua. So let's, uh, yeah. let's, give, let's give us our biblical text here, Annie. Yeah, you're going to love this, Father. So our first reading for this Sunday is taken from Joshua 24, verses... 1 through 2a, then 15 through 17, then 18b. Oh, Lord, have mercy. There's got to be there's got to be a reason why they like carve out these spots. I mean, they're trying to like keep well, the flow of the story. I'm yeah, imagining. I imagine. Yeah, you'll see. But but it, 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 we're not doing this any but favor. It's really <laughs> funny when you read it out loud like that, you know, yeah. <laughs> All right. The responsorial psalm taken again from Psalm 34, except we are hearing different verses from Psalm 34 this weekend. The gospel, as Father was saying, John chapter 6, verses 60 through 69, and the epistle, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 32. There we have it. So, uh, So let's just jump in here. We got plenty to do here in Joshua um, yeah. with, uh, you know, geography and and what's going on in the story. Because uh, those verses don't help us. We're skipping. We're just going to do it all. That's what we have to do. You have to read from verse one through verse 18. And if all we right. don't do that, we're not really going to understand. No, uh, uh, let, let's do it the way it's, it's cut up here. OK. And, and then I'm not giving anybody a hard time. They, they decided, you know, for the sake of brevity. But when we're doing Bible study, we can't do that because yeah. uh, you, watch this. Here, here we are. Here's how the reading goes, right? Joshua gathered together all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, summoning their leaders, uh, their elders, their leaders, their judges, and their officers. When they stood in rank before God, Joshua addressed the people. If it does not please you to serve the Lord, decide today whom you will serve. And the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord. Well, what's Joshua's problem here? Like, what well, he's kind of negative, isn't he? I mean, he's not a very supportive yeah, he sounds uh, like a, leader. Like, he sounds kind of mean. Yeah, he's kind of yeah, he's not being nice to them. I mean, wouldn't it have been nicer if he had just said, Joshua addressed the people, it is good to serve the Lord, and you should always make a decision to follow him, right? Isn't that the positive message? But he comes out in the negative. If it doesn't, if, if it doesn't please you to serve the Lord, then then just don't do it, right? Let's not play games here, right? He's, he's uh, Obviously, there's a context to this, right? And that's the unfaithfulness of the people. So let's go ahead and read, because actually, when we skip these verses, it, 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 it really hurts us going into John 6, because John 6 is built in the Gospel of John very much like Joshua 24. So Joshua mm. 24, in some sense we could say, is a summing up of everything God has done. John 6 is, in it, it would, the whole gospel of John then, is that summing up, right? Is that story of what God has done. And then we come to John 6, in which Jesus puts it out there to them regarding the Eucharist, and, and basically says, this is where it's at. Either you're going to follow me, or you're going to go somewhere else, right? And so, and of course, the people were disingenuous. So let's go ahead and read this. Joshua 24, verses 1 through 18, Annie. Okay, so you want me to read the full text? I do. Okay. Here we go. I'll get out my Bible and not my lectionary book. Oh, come on, Annie. I had it open. I had it open. All right. I'm not a cheater. All right. You know what my job is here. 
Okay, here we go. From my Bible. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, your fathers lived of old beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt, and I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it, and afterwards I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. And when they cried to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did to Egypt, and you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land. I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and invited Baal, Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore, he blessed you. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And I gave them into your hand, and I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you, the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities which you had not built, and you dwelt therein. You ate the fruit of the vineyards and all of your olive yards, which you did not plant. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods of which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if you be unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us out and our brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage and who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. He said, then put away the foreign gods, which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord, our God, we will serve and his voice we will obey. Well, I'll tell you why they skipped all those verses. Those words are hard to pronounce. <laughs> Good grief, especially if you haven't read it ahead of time. So what 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 was skipped, Annie? If you had to summarize, tell me say, okay, they skipped this. All what? of the 
stuff that they didn't do to serve the Lord, yeah. all of the gods that they decided to serve instead of the Lord. And but and what, and all what, the stuff that God did for them. That's there's the key that is is I think most important for us. Um, that that the it, it, when we're looking at John chapter six, because when I say that John that Joshua twenty four is much like the Gospel of John up to chapter six. What I mean is that God did all this stuff for them and did all these miracles, right? All these amazing things and, and then conquered nations and they, and, and every time they relied upon the Lord and did what he said to do, everything worked out okay. Right. But hidden in their heart was always this lack of trust in the Lord. And it's played out in their desire to, go after foreign gods, right? Where are they going to secure their salvation, right? Isn't that, isn't that the whole business, right? How are they going to make sure that they're going to win the war? Find the bride, have the children. How is it that their whole life is going to work out? Well, they, they, they turn to, as we turn to, to, to the Lord, right? We turn to God and say, oh Lord, in this most difficult situation in which I can't, I don't have the power myself to 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 achieve this great thing. I need your help, right? Lord, I got to find a good wife, right? And I'm not finding any on my own. So I turn to you, please, I got to meet someone, right? Lord, I'm sick and I can't get healed on my own. I turn to the Lord, right? All these times of great need. And that's why God's people turned to false gods, right? Because they didn't trust the Lord right. in what he had promised to them and that he would do for them everything necessary. Um, and uh, and you can see this now if we just kind of take a look at this, um, at this text. I'm just going to, I had been flipping while you were reading, to be honest with you. I'm sorry about while that. While you continue to flip. Is yeah. this kind of this would be kind of like us today, like saying we're turning to the Lord, but we kind of have these like superstitious things, like we don't want to jinx ourselves, you know, or yeah, sort of like yeah. that, maybe. Because yeah. I think it's hard for us to like imagine, you know, carrying a foreign idol in our pocket, you know, just in All case. Right. I'll tell you what your foreign idol is. Always and everywhere in modern society is dough money right yeah you're That's, right right now everybody we just lost half our right priest talking about money we're cutting out yeah <laughs> whatever if you don't want to listen you know what i mean go find which god you're going to serve go ahead so but if you want to listen <laughs> if you want to serve the lord isn't that true right we we are really like our 401k and our retirement and our safety and security and our exercise gyms and our all that stuff now, these are all can be goods, right? But the fact is, in modern American society, in secular in the secular world, they become they become the end, right? The the goal, the god, which I have to have. Um, and so, um, but if we take a look, let's just contextualize this text very quickly. I mean, we just did it in twenty four by reading the whole thing, right? But right. but you also have to stop because you have a, a geographic stamp. At the beginning, yeah, I was going to ask, where is right? this taking place? Yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. first thing. Okay, that's the first thing I do. It says, "Do geography real quick," and then we have to ask ourselves, "Why are they there?" Yeah, right. Great. So, so here that we are in chapter twenty-four. <clears throat> then Joshua, verse one, gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders. Why Shechem? Well, there's a, Shechem has there's two names. Is known by two variations of the same name, Shechem and Sikar. Sikar is the is the is the version that we know most commonly from the Gospel of John. So hold your Bible there in Joshua chapter uh, twenty four and flip over with me to the Gospel of John chapter four and uh, uh, verse four. He, as Jesus, had to pass through Samaria. He came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Okay, Sychar, Shechem, same area, same place. Um, uh, and uh, uh, where where is this 
where is this located? Okay, I'm going to share with you. I'm going to share with you um, what I always do, which is to tell you, hey, guys, use the modern tools you have in front of you, which is Google. It's kind of nice, right? So I'm going to share this. And all, the only thing I did is very simple. It's just a habit. I typed in Shechem. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, Wikipedia has got a little article there about Shechem. And there you see it. Now, all this, there's the first thing. Oh, wait a minute. They're in the land. They're oh. in the Holy Land, right? I mean, you know that from that map, right? Or or here we can go like this and go and click on this. I think this will do it for us, right? And I know... I know this is all rough, guys. I'm like, Father, you should have had this in a slideshow. No, I'm trying to tell you what you can do to use your tools you need to kind of get a sense of where things are located, okay? So here's there, boom, Shechem, okay? Right there, Jerusalem. So we're north of Jerusalem. We're in the territory of what became Samaria. You know, we've talked about that before, about this, the Northern Ten Tribes area. Um, but this is before the split, right? This is before the 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 you know before David, before Solomon, before the before. kings. Yeah, I was going to say, right? So this yeah. is still united, but it's united in a funny kind of way in this story. Now, before I go, I'm just because we are in John chapter four. I'm going to give you a little thing, a little nice thing. Check this out. This is Jacob's well, and you can oh. go there today into this little uh, Orthodox church. And you can see there, and you can get the fresh water. That's where these people wow. are doing, right? Getting the fresh water out of the well. Okay, but we're not talking about John chapter 4, so I'm going to stop that. Um, and so you, then you have to say, oh, wait a minute. In Joshua 24, they're in the land? Yes. Okay, and 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 the, your key uh, point here is chap Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5, verse 10. Okay, this is where they come over. Well, in the in the chapters before that, but this is where they come over, right? And they hold they hold the Passover. So they come into Jericho, and then their their uh, uh, chapter six, the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. Chapter seven is your key that unlocks chapter twenty four. Okay, this is after Jericho's walls come coming down, but the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Okay, so basically what happens, and you can read these couple of chapters here if you want, um, is that Jericho's walls come tumbling down and they go and score themselves some free idols from the idol seller who's like, you know, we give up. And they're like, okay, we'll take one of your idols. And this happens throughout the book of Joshua and into the book of Judges. And and so and what so what happens? Well, the people are not faithful. They come into the land and Jer the first city they conquer is Jericho, but then they lose faith. And the next city they go to try to take, they get destroyed, right? They get totally beaten in the war. And Joshua is like, what's going on, Lord? I thought we were supposed to take this land. He's like, yeah, look in the pockets of that guy. He's got a little idol in his pocket, you know? And then, and so things don't go well. So that's the rest of the book of Joshua. If you just flip your Bible with me and look at your like headlines of your chapters or maybe the top of your pages, what do you got? You got the destruction of Jericho, and then you got the sin of Achan. That's that's the this thing with the idol business. And then then they capture the city of Ai after they got beat there because they repent. And then they have the victory over the, the Amorites, and then the conquest of the whole land, and the dividing of the land, and the territory allotted to Judah, and the territories of the tribes. I'm just reading the titles of the cities of refuge, cities of the Levites, and then Boom, chapter 22, chapter 23, chapter 24 um, is, is where we're at now at the end of this story. If you take a look at chapter 22, verse 10, And when they came to the region about the Jordan that lies in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan 
an altar of great size. And the people of Israel heard it and said, Behold, the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the Manassehites, I'm just kidding, I was joking, have built an altar in the frontier of the land of Canaan, in the region about the Jordan, on the side that belongs to the people of Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered to make war against them. And basically said, What are you guys doing? You, you become pagans. You're building an altar apart from 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 the the Lord, and uh, and and then they say, "No, we would never do that." It was an altar of peace. It was an altar of union. It was an altar by which we could recognize the value of other cultures that worship in different ways okay not really that's not what they said but it sounds very familiar to our current climate but anyways here we are and they say no no we were being faithful to the lord and yet we know the reality of the thing so there it is in joshua chapter 23 verse 14 and following joshua starts going if you follow the lord you'll be blessed but if you don't follow the Lord, you're going to be cursed. Okay, you can see that verse 14, Joshua 100, verse 14. Now I'm about to go to my way of the earth, and you and your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord has God has promised concerning me. All have come to pass for you, but not one of them has failed. But just as all the good things which the Lord has God has promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until you have destroyed from you from off this good land which the Lord of God has given and if you transgress the covenant. And now he goes, dudes, here's what God has done. And that's what he's just read, right? Um, and then the people are like, we'll serve the Lord, Joshua, what we promise. And this is what we don't get in this reading, but you got to get it to get the whole thing. And that's verse... 23 after they're like we're going to be faithful joshua then joshua turns to them and he says then put away the foreign gods which are among you <laughs> so in other words they're like oh yeah we're gonna do it we're gonna do it but what do they got there in their shirt pocket a little pocket mama a little something you know and uh not good right their heart is not with the lord that's what i got annie for your context wow and then you know, Joshua dies and we move into the book of Judges and they don't even tell their kids the stories of what God did for yes, them, right? That's from, the whole theme in Judges, right? It goes from bad to worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, the key that you're looking for there, Annie, is chapter 2, Judges chapter 2, verse 6 through 10, which you guys can read on your own. But Annie's whole point is, which gets us a little bit far afield from our study here, but basically, yeah. basically all the Joshua, cat, you know, you know bullet pointed for them right there they then don't actually teach the next generation so the next generation doesn't even know who the lord is yeah because they didn't witness to him what god had done in their lives you know i have a very similar situation here honestly uh i that i have to give you you know i should show you guys do you guys want to go on a field trip you want to go on sure. a field trip, Andy? I would love going, to go on a field trip we're gonna go on a field trip right now with father hezekiah and you're going to see what God is doing. It's a miracle taking place in our midst right now. Presto okay, ready? okay. Presto bingo. That's a miracle. And you are hey. now in Father Hezekiah's office. And I am going to walk you. My office is really just a cubby hole in the side of the kitchen. But right now, because the miracle is taking place is the construction of our church here in Sacramento. We just built a beautiful new hall. And I'm going to switch this. I'm going to go um, like that for you guys. I think that's oh, better. Isn't that better, Annie? Yep, that's better. So, so this is our new hall and this is our temporary church wall. It's in our hall because our church is there in here. Uh, and you might as well see it because we're going on a field trip. And it's just a lot of fun here at Sunday Gospel Reflections. Here on the, what are we, the 21st Sunday, Annie? Yep. Yeah. Looking ahead to the 21st Sunday, yeah. So here's a nice, beautiful icon of the dormition oh, nice. of the Mother of God. See the assumption? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How's that? St. George? Saint Can you George? see St. George? Yeah. Okay. 
And then this is our temporary church. Okay. And why do we have a temporary church? Because we're building our new church out here. And uh, I'm going to just step outside and show you the miracle that has taken place is that we have a new church that is, uh, well, it's, it's our old church building, which was actually our new church building, which we bought. Um, and, uh, but we're doing a full renovation inside. But the miracle is this. Take a look at what you see out here. What is that, Annie? Can you see that? A tree. I see It's a an tree. olive tree. That Ooh. is a 60-year-old olive tree. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Oh, my gosh. That's see? beautiful. And uh, we just brought these in by a, by a crane came in and we planted it. We have four of them. And, ah. uh, and so there you go. I'm going to switch back oh. now to the computer and I'll tell you what the, what, how this has everything to do with our Sunday gospel reflection. It's a zoom miracle. I went from me out there to being here. Slip, <laughs> slip. Oh. Imagine that. Um, and uh, so here's 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 how this has anything to do with our Sunday gospel reflection and you, which forced us to go beyond our Sunday gospel relation over to Judges chapter two verse six, and that is that I walked out on the patio on Sunday, having brought in on Friday these olive trees. I um, four families joined together, donated. Uh, I'm I'm donating one in memory of my father, and uh, donated to remember their loved ones by the planting of the olive trees, and so. Um, I walked down the patio and this uh, this uh, parishioner of mine who will remain nameless, I walked up and I said, now he's from Palestine. And uh, I said, he's from uh, a town, Be Betjala, which is right near uh, uh, Bethlehem, right? There's Bethlehem, there's Bet Sohor, and there's Betjala. And a lot of my parishioners are from Betjala. So they just, I said to him, hey, I think the olive trees, expecting him to be like, Abuna, father, my father, the beautiful, it's like back home. And he says to me, those aren't 60 years old. Now, that's what happens, right? You got a miracle in front of you. And <laughs> you can't even see the goodness of the Lord and what he has done for his people. Wow. Yeah? You yeah. better tell your children about the miracle that God has done in your life. And there's miracles every day all around you. We fail to tell our children and they grow up not knowing the Lord. You know, Annie, I'm really actually, I, I kept saying that you took us off track, but you didn't. Because um, this whole story I just shared with you about, about this inability to see the miracle um, is everything about the gospel of John. It's right. exactly what leads up to the crisis of john chapter six and we need to get, get over there because we need to spend a little bit of time there looking mm -hmm. at a couple of key points where where there the 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 um there's a blindness that develops they have like cataracts or something that starts the gospel of john chapter one and it leads up until they can't see anything uh in the chapter following in the chapters following uh john chapter six they actually become blind Right. And that comes out in the story of the blind man. So. Yeah. So let's look at the responsorial psalm. We have the same response, taste and see the goodness of the Lord, yes. one of your faves, but different verses. And um, it makes sense now, you know, the Lord has eyes for the just and the ears for their cry. The Lord confronts the evildoers to destroy remembrance of them from the earth. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Kind of filling uh, out the 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 reading from Joshua in a way. You see how important it is you have context because because this, this smart whoever it was the lectionary guys, you know they know the context so it's like readily available to them. But your average Catholic in the pew doesn't know the context of what's going on, and then the response for the psalm doesn't really make sense, right? Yeah. And then the whole catechetical end of the of the liturgy is lost. This is why we're doing what we're doing. Right. Um, and this calls us to repentance, does it not? Right. Yeah. And I mean, this now applies to us. Right. And 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 if if we if we trust the Lord and do what he wills, then then good things will come, you know, and then if, but if we want to be destroyed from remembrance upon the earth, 
<laughs> then uh then knock yourself out yep okay <laughs> exactly yeah um and uh um i've got a couple of quotes from the church fathers um uh from saint basil the great he who has despised present things and has given himself to the word of god and is using his mind for thoughts that are above and are more divine he would be the one who has a contrite heart and has made it a sacrifice that is not despised by the lord for a contrite and a humble heart, O God, you will not despise. He who has no vanity and is not proud of anything human, he is the one who is contrite in heart and humble of spirit. Okay. So the question is, how does that uh, apply book back to these people, the time of Joshua, who, while they say one thing with their mouth, in their heart is something completely different, right? And then being able to apply that then through that to our situation today and staying in the church this is why I'm saying great Sunday to go to Holy Confession, you know, and I had the blessing this past Sunday, by the way, to uh, to be able to go to confession. For me, it's very difficult because not very many Byzantine priests rolling around and available for confession. But I had a visiting priest this past Sunday and oh, what a blessing to be able to go to confession and then celebrate the liturgy like literally right afterwards it was awesome. So awesome. I encourage you guys to do that. John chapter nice. six. And we're at verse 60. John chapter 6, starting with verse 60. Let me know when you're flipped there, Father. John chapter 6. I am. Boom, I'm there. Go. Boom, verse he's 60. there. All right, here we go. Many of Jesus' disciples who were listening said, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? Since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, does this shock you? What if you were to see the son of man ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit that gives life while the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning the ones who would not believe and the one who would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my father. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. Jesus then said to the twelve, do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. All right. So, Father, I understand that what Jesus said about, you know, eat my flesh and drink my blood. You shall mm -hmm. not have life within me, uh, within you. Um, I do understand that that is like objectively shocking. Like I get that. I get mm -hmm. it. I get it. Even though I let it wash over me as a Catholic anyway, but why are his disciples murmuring about it? Can you talk about just how shocking this was to them? Well yeah, we we talked about that a little bit last week, Annie. And I will just read for you, share with you St. Augustine, who says, if his disciples consider this our teaching, what must his enemies have thought? <laughs> but it was necessary that there would be some things that should not be understood by all. The secret of God should make people more eager and attentive, not hostile. But people did not perceive that what he said had a deeper meaning. And there's the key. Mm. Or that grace went along with it, rather receiving the matter in their own way and taking his words in a human sense. Mm. They understood him as if he spoke of the cutting of the flesh of the word into pieces for distribution to those who believed on him. Okay, so this opens up for us this entire passage, which is... Uh, which which we need to um, to get into because there's an apologetic point that becomes the central the central uh, uh, what defense 
of those who would claim to be followers of Jesus and yet do not accept his word today regarding the Eucharist and the real presence of Christ in Holy Communion. And it is this verse um, that uh, um, uh, ver uh, verse 63, uh, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. You see, uh. Catholics, you see, Jesus isn't giving us his flesh because flesh ain't going to do anything for you. You see that, Annie? Yeah, that's the common verse used against Catholics in this passage. And uh, we got to go after that a little bit. OK, so we're going to spend just a little bit of time uh, in the Gospel of John, because in the, it always right. A text without a context is no text at all. No text at all. And we got to come in order. And I don't even have these written down. I'm just going to let them flow and we'll see where this takes us. OK, in John okay. chapter one, first of all, Jesus is identified as the word right the word of god and okay. so and so this is this is our first first thing are they going to entrust themselves to his word but in chapter uh in chapter 2 um uh verse 18 the jews then said what sign have you to show us for doing this okay so these are people that are looking for signs looking for well he had just performed a sign which is the cleansing of the temple but they hadn't seen it as what it was meant to be, okay? And then we have that passage, I always like to go to verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did, but he did not trust himself to them because he knew all men. He knew one to bear witness to men. So he there would not trust sign. themselves yeah. because they, they says they believed, but what did they believe? They believed because of the miracle right okay so far so good but in chapter 3 verse 1 we were introduced to nicodemus who says we know who you are and this adds a wrinkle to this entire thing we're going to lay out here and that is that throughout the gospel there will be this question of whether they are able to judge in a heavenly way to be able to see in a god what kind of way to be able to hear according to God's word, or whether they're going to trust in themselves and their own ability to judge and see, right? And so that develops, and we get a very similar passion. Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus here, um, in, ver in verse, um, verse 12, we get a very similar passage to John chapter 6 that we're reading right now. Look at this, verse 12. Um, if I have told you earlier things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now, one, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the son of man. Okay, so now we have this reference to the ascension again, which is repeated in John chapter six. So you know there's a connection that John's making between what happened with Nicodemus and them trying to judge Jesus to say, we know who you are. And Jesus' response regarding knowledge and earthly things and heavenly things right how can they possibly come to knowledge of heavenly things if they can't even if they can't even really see the signs right yeah. they, the miracles are going on and jesus all through this now jesus is doing the miracles right jesus is healing the blind and healing the paralytics and do, walking on water and he's multiplying the loaves and fishes right um and uh um and then in chapter four uh verse 46 and following jesus returns to capernaum um and he goes to heal the official son right in verse 46 see that yeah and in verse 49 uh oh no no i'm sorry verse four verse 48 jesus therefore said to him unless you see signs and wonders you will not believe you see, there's the, the tension that's being set up here in the Gospel of John, that these people are demanding miracles, and yet their, their ability to see the miracles even starting to decay a little bit, okay? Their, uh, their, uh, their eyes are not able to see, right? In verse chapter 5, the, the healing of the paralytic takes place, um, 
Uh, and then look at verse 24 of chapter 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word, not he who sees my sign, but he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, right? And then we all this time we've been spending in John chapter 5 and 6 with the multiplication of the loaves and fishes and their inability to see the sign, right? Uh, um, oh, right? Chapter 6, verse uh, verse 26, Jesus answered that, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, right? So they're not even at the miracle level anymore, but because you ate your fill of the loaves, right? And then they, what do they say? Show us a sign, right? What verse is it, Danny? Um, verse 30. So they said to him, then what sign do you do? Admitting their own inability to see the sign that he just did, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Then uh, we're, we're almost done with this little this little march through John here. Um, but um, but uh, um, verse chapter 8, verse 15 you judge according to the flesh. Here's the, 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 the thing that's going to unlock it for us. You judge according to the flesh. What does it mean to judge according to the flesh? It means to be a Nicodemus, right? We know who you are. We can see what's going on. We know and therefore can judge. And by the way, we have to go back. I'll hold your hand there for a second. You got to go back because I missed a, a really critical verse here in the prologue. The prologue, of course, is like that 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 that, pe that little pebble, right? That lands in the pond and ripples out. So every theme that develops in the Gospel of John is contained in the in the in the uh, prologue. So I'm going to go back to uh, the prologue to verse uh, ten. He was in the world. No, I got to go back before that. So verse one, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and, 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 and I got lost. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him was made nothing that was made. Uh, in him was life, the life was life of men. Light shines in darkness, darkness could not comprehend it, could not uh, take it in, overcome it, could not, right? It couldn't judge it. That's the, the word there is, is parameters around it, Right. And and that's what that's what Nicodemus is trying to do. And then look at verse ten. He was in the world; the world was made to him. Yet the world knew him not. Right? It could not understand him. Um, and uh, and this then becomes these people, and this and it, it develops in the Gospel of John. Now, there's one final passage which I skipped there in chapter seven that uh, brings it all home. That's John chapter seven, verse. 24 look at that this is the one this one in mm -hmm. chapter eight together do not judge by appearances what appears to you but judge with right judgment and this is what jesus is talking about here my protestant brothers and sisters who are in this sunday golf reflection with us hiding in your closets um you, you gotta give it up there's no defense in the Gospel of John. It is no possible way that you can read John chapter 6, uh, uh, verse, um, uh, what is it, 62, yeah, uh, 63, right. in yeah. any way other than according to what he's telling them regarding their flesh and their judgment there is no possible way that you can say that Je jesus's flesh is to no avail for jesus has just said that his flesh is to much avail you see he's not speaking of his flesh he's speaking of your flesh and when he's speaking of your flesh he's using a, a an idiom that is present throughout the gospel about people who are using their noggin to try to figure out God's stuff, okay? And this is where we need to allow the Lord to speak and to tell us the truth, to realize that our understanding, our intellect is very limited. And if you're going to understand divine things, then you've got to ascend with the Lord to the divine places and see through him, 
because he is the only one who has ascended to the Father. He is the only one who has seen the Father. He is the only one who knows the Father. And there's no way you're going to come to see, know, or hear anything unless you come to know, see, and hear him. And be in communion with him. I say one last thing about knowledge here from a philosophical standpoint. The, the classic definition of knowledge is, is uh, knowledge is the union of the knower and the known. I've said this to you before, Andy, right? And so, so that I can I literally, the things I come to know become part of who I am, right? Formerly, they were outside of me. I come to know the oak tree. I have it within me. So there's this communion which takes place. But that communion is always a communion for us in humility, in which we receive the truth of the reality which God has made into my soul. I come to know not by my own powers and judgment, but by the truth which God has revealed, whether it be an oak tree or his word. And I must humble myself to, uh, to receive that objective truth objective knowledge obje of the object which is outside of me now comes to be within me according to its way not according to my way and that's exactly what jesus is talking about and here we have to go back to our um to our um quote from saint augustine because it's too good to to, to not give it twice if his disciples consider this a hard saying what must his enemies have thought but it was necessary that there would be some things that would not be understood by all. The secret of God should make people more eager and attentive, not hostile. But the people did not perceive that what he said had a deeper meaning or that grace went along with it. Rather, receiving the matter in their own way and taking his, his, his words in a human sense, they understood him as if he spoke of the cutting of the flesh and the word into pieces for distribution to those who believed on him. And I would just say to all of our Catholics that are joining us in this Bible study, uh, don't think that you understand the Eucharist. It is a miracle of God. It is given to us according to his ways and according to his word. And while I, I love Thomistic theology and all of those good things, scholasticism and all those good things, there is a limit. Yeah. There is a, 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 a there is a beyond form and matter. Um, and and those things are given to us as helps to understand, but not as ways to say that we know. And we understand according to our limited way of thinking, because the miracles of God are beyond our capacity and ability, our limited ability to understand. Well, that's like channeling that, like, we know you, you're the carpenter's son, you know? I mean, it's like kind of taking that sort of attitude for it. And I, I, I love that point because, um, because uh, while he says that, what chapter are you in there, Annie, when he says that? Is that... Um, uh, well, I mean, I was thinking of Nicodemus at first, but actually they say it here yeah. in, in John 6. It's like verse verse uh, 42. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Um, yes. You know, well, I guess that's not them saying yeah. exactly, we know who's you. No, this but... is the one. Yes, whose father and mother we know. This is actually the same exact point. They are, notice what they, whose father and mother we know. Mm -hmm. They're thinking, St. Augustine, right? They're thinking on human terms. Yeah. Right? Then this thing develops even further in, um, in uh, chapter um, uh, eight. I mean, it comes up all the time here, but chapter um, chapter nine, this is where they actually go blind, right? Um, mm -hmm. where they say, um, uh, this man, we do not know. Here it is. Chapter nine, verse 30. Or just before that, verse 29. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but for this man, we do not know where he comes from. This is how it develops. We're skipping very fast, but when Annie just pointed out to you to this chapter, they've gone completely. 
they not only are unable to judge his his they 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 think they know where he's from and then they say we don't know where he's from right so they become totally blinded and that all comes out in chapter 9 in verse 38 um um he said lord i believe this is the blame it and he worshiped him and jesus said for judgment i came into the world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind yeah there you have it okay um the other way that i was thinking as you read that saint augustine quote was you know how much pressure it must be to have to read the bible and feel like i have to figure it out for myself and not be able to receive the teaching um of the church on it it's a lot less pressure to read scripture when when you have an authority to interpret it for you and and you can receive the truth and humility in that way and accept it um yes but i i'm going to challenge you a little bit annie though because i don't want to encourage people not to let the scriptures challenge you well sure so, absolutely yeah, and i know you know that i know you. yeah know that. i didn't but, mean but, it in that uh, way but yeah yeah but you're right just you're the saying, like, light of the holy spirit right yeah. and so you can then actually go much deeper than someone who doesn't have that gift to be able to lay aside all earthly cares, as we say in the Byzantine liturgy, um, and, uh, and then dive deeper into the mystery that is that is present before you. Right. Yeah. Well, and, speaking and, of which, talk about Peter's response to this. Yeah, that's it. Is well, his response is where it's all at. Right. You yeah. have the words, verse verse uh, sixty eight b. You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Okay. Um, and of course, this is where Judas comes into the scene. Um, and uh, St. John Christum says, Peter, Peter's was a speech of, of the greatest love, proving that Christ was more precious to them than father or mother. And that it might not seem to be said as a result of thinking that there was no one whose guidance they could look to, he added, you have the words of eternal life. These men already confess the resurrection and all the apportionment that shall happen there. Okay. So yeah, Peter's words are beautiful and should be what we repeat over and over again, Lord. And, 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 and like the, like the, the official in the gospel, Lord, um, I, uh, um, how does he go here? Uh, John chapter four, um, verse 51, no, verse 49, the official said, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus says, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and mm. went to his way. Right. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Awesome. Let's take well, a look at the epistle uh here. yes and very interesting that such a shall we say hard teaching shows up on on this sunday that uh that we hear about jesus asking people to accept hard teaching yes there's this is but the church does, I should say, Father, this will make you angry, but the church does give the option to skip over the the hard part of this. This is this is the wedding, the wedding epistle. Yeah. OK, and my brothers and sisters, for those young people that are gathered here in our Sunday House Reflection who are planning to get married. There are no options for funerals for weddings, for baptisms. Just pull out your old Tridentine missile and say, Father, that's the reading I for it. Yep. Right? Because th oh, this is it. And of course it upsets everybody, but we're going to do it anyway. So <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through 32. Yeah, here we go. Brothers and sisters, be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of his wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, he himself the savior of the body. 
as the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in splendor, without spot or wink wrinkle or any such thing, so that she might be holy and without blemish. So also husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one hates his own flesh, but rather nourishes and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and the church. So what do you, why do you think Annie and, and, and my brothers and sisters, I didn't prepare to put Annie in the spot and prepare. Oh, wow. Why do you think the church chose this reading for John chapter six and Joshua chapter 24? Um, well, I mean, well, you put in John Joshua chapter 24. That's an interesting point. Um, I mean, with John chapter six, I think it's a, a beautiful point about Christ handing his body over to the church, um, and, and using marriage as an image to illustrate that. I mean, we're looking at it as, you know, oh, geez, the husband has to be, you know, the woman has to be subordinate Isn't to the it? husband. We're looking at it from the wrong angle. We got to look at it from God's angle here. He's giving his flesh for the church and using marriage as a way to illustrate it. Yeah. So the, the, uh, the, I think there's multiple ways we could go at this thing. There's all sorts of crossing lines here. The first one is the offensive one, which is obedience, right? Yeah. And that's why I think Joshua chapter 24 does come in sure, and yeah. Joshua chapter okay. six, but yeah. both of these uh uh, uh both of these situations are prefaced john 6 and john and and joshua 24 are prefaced by salvation history right 24 is saying this is what god has done for you aren't you going to follow him now john chapter 6 or i say john chapters 1 through 6 are this is what god has done for you and john chapter 6 is aren't you going to follow him now yeah Ephesians chapter five, while it begins by saying, why is be subordinate to your husbands? There's a reason why, right? It, it, this is, it sounds like Joshua. Um, choose now who you're going to serve, right? But why is it that they are being called to choose because of what God has done? Chapter five in Ephesians, follows this same pattern, right? Be obedient. Choose who you're going to follow. Follow your husband. But there's a reason. Because of what he's done. And what has he done? If this is, Ephesians 5 is radical. I always, I love this passage. We spend marriage prep. I spend hours with the people. This is the center of our whole marriage prep time with young couples. Because I, you guys see how here offensive this is. I mean, you're you're offended right now because it says that wives should be supporting their husbands. St. Paul's way more radical than that. He says, be obedient to your husband as the church is obedient to Christ. Okay, listen to this. Be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. Why subordinate to your husbands? It's going to get stronger than that. As to the Lord. This is where your head, ladies, has to blow right off your shoulders. St. Paul is saying that you should follow your husband like you follow God. 
Let, let it let's sink in for a second. Is that not what he just said, Annie? Sounds like it. And now Annie's like going, Oh, I don't think I can go there, not in public. I can't go there in public. That's what he says. Yeah, sounds like and it. Say, How is that possible? How is it possible? It is impossible. Unless your husband is gone. And what is Father Hezekiah talking about in St. Paul's theology? Turn to John chapter 6, sorry, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. My Bible should just fall open to this you chapter. Should. Okay, go ahead. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know? That you, sorry, I was just trying to do it from memory. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into sin, the word baptized, baptizing in Greek means to be plunged into Christ, right? You're made one with him, in, right? So that the one who is baptized is another Christ. St. Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Okay, for a woman to be able to do what St. Paul does, teaches, her husband must have given his life totally to Christ. He must be committed to a union with Christ, so intimate, so committed, that she knows that he has given his total life to Christ, into whom she has been baptized, which means that he is to her as Christ is on the cross to the church. Total self-giving love. Absolutely nothing left of selfishness. Absolutely not even a nothing left of a me firstness apart from his wife everything everything is a complete and total self-giving love now i ask you if a man does this for you he no longer lives for himself in any way then would you not reciprocate that total self-gift by your total self-gift and then the two become one flesh. Yes? Now that's one wrinkle or line that we could run down this epistle. The other one, of course, is regarding the flesh and the church and our union with Christ and our understanding. And this is where we need to end up. Okay. It's going to take us a little bit off of our track of, you know, the obedience part and all this stuff. And, and, and uh, just a little bit of a realization here. It, it, according to St. Paul's theology, those who have been baptized into Christ are the body of Christ, the walking incarnation of God. This is why Jesus can say in the Gospel of Matthew, I will never leave you. Right? The church is the manifestation of God's love. The church is the incarnation and revelation that God has fully given his life so that he is totally present in the life of the church, which means that when we receive communion, that those around us are in a marital state with us, if you, if I can be so bold as to say that. Our relationship with our fellow parishioner, so I don't even like that word because it's so, it's, it, it, our fellow Christian standing next to us is so intimate that we are called to do for them what the Lord has done for us. We are called to be in their life, Christ, right? In this bridal relationship, in this in this total self-giving love. And this is this is what must be restored in the church today. And I go after this all the time about the vending machine business, and we and we can't live like that anymore. Once we realize that 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 the miracle taking place not only on the altar in our reception of Christ, but because of that communion, our relationship with our brother and sister in Christ 
and how splendid the worship must be. Worship is our love for God poured out. How splendid the worship must be in the church and how equivalently splendid our worship of neighbor must be. I mean, use that word in the old English sense, right? With my body, I worship thee is the old way of saying it, right? In the marital service, I lay down my life for you. Are we laying down our life for our brother and sister in Christ in our churches? And if not, we must begin to do so today. To Christ our God be glory both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen.